What up, AP World family? Here we go. We're going to finish up Unit 5, the Industrial Revolution. And that means we've got one unit to go. Now, granted, it's two chapters, but if we hit this thing hard, oh, baby, we're on our way. All right, so you can see all the things we're going to try to accomplish in a very short period of time. We're looking at how the Industrial Revolution spread to Europe and the world, how governments did and did not get involved in the industrial problems. We're going to look at uh, new economic styles, things like the free market, capitalism, uh, divisions of labor, what liberalism had done to politics. Uh, and then we're going to look at some of the problems and solutions and see if it makes sense contextually with everything going on. Let's just do this. God's sake. All right. Spreading of industry. All right. So England did not want the rest of the world to have industry. And that makes a lot of sense. Why? Because they were leading the Industrial Revolution. To give away ideas was to help your opponents, your competitors, catch up. And so they had pretty harsh laws about uh, sharing technology or taking machines abroad. All right. So eventually other European companies or countries, I should say, and even America, paid some pretty top dollar, big coin, bottom bill kind of stuff to lure um, companies and machinery out of Britain so that they could get a little slice of that of the pie. Okay, the other thing that really helped spread industry as technology got better and they could travel faster, as people traveled, they traveled to new regions. And so each of those contact points is much like the coronavirus right now. It helped spread and then spread and spread, right? And so a steamboat shows up to do business, it brings in some investment capital, and also that money leads to more. Every a mile of railroad track means more possible towns, factories that can be interconnected by a web of industry. So there's just some images. There you go. And so this would be the first railroad. We'll go back to here. This is the Liverpool-Manchester line. All right. And so by the 1830s, we have railroads. And so there we go. We got people moving all of 20 some miles per hour down the track. Right. But remember how important it is. It does allow them to move huge cargoes uh, to places that water can't reach. And it puts it on timetables that are more um, conducive to business. And so it just links. And so look at this map. 1840. Here we go. Wisconsin becomes a state right between these two dates and so some railroads really only in england and by 1850 whoop, ow, look at the continent whew, lots of rail and eventually by the 1880s and 1890s there'd be rail all the way across russia all right economic developments this one we're gonna look i'm gonna look back for a minute it's so, so damn cheesy all right we're gonna look backwards for a minute during the enlightenment adam smith had come up with this idea of free market capitalism something that he called laissez-faire, which meant government, keep your hands off the economy, let it control itself. And so those ideas allowed companies to make piles of money. Other innovations came from uh, the division of labor, also from Adam Smith, where he said, instead of doing all of the jobs in a factory, each person, person does one. And then they get really good, really fast at it. So instead of having 10 people do 10 things, have 10 people each do one specialized task. And that eventually leads to assembly lines. And what that leads to is really boring, horrible factory conditions. But tons of production, lots of cheap crap, which means people can buy it because it's cheap. They uh, all of a sudden have a higher standard of living. So even though it's not perfect, the standard of living is improving. Right? People can afford canned foods and soap. And by the end of the 19th century, uh, you would have to say that life had gotten better for most. Okay. It got really good for some, right? So we call them the middle class, but these cats were fat, bro. Uh, they had all that money. And that really, as we look at England, shouldn't be surprising. When we go back to the 1600s and the 1700s, they had joint stock companies that allowed middle class investors, people with some money to put their money in and take some risk on new colonies or the spice trade. Well, that same concept applied to industry. Factories are hell of expensive. Machines cost a lot of money. But if a 100 investors can all pool their resources, buy a factory, fill it with machines, well, they're going to get a big fat dividend by the end of that. Now, you team that concept up with classical liberalism, that idea that, right, governments should do as little as possible 
to interfere with the economy, right, to leave it free, liberty, liberalism, uh, that allowed the middle class to make huge money. And we're talking about enough money to have servants. Uh, most of these people er owned multiple homes. And so during the winter months, these middle class factory owners lived in the cities and monitored their factories. And in the summers, they would move out to their summer homes out in the countryside because London was literally called the big stink because it was so polluted and filthy from all the waste that they, uh, they didn't want to be there during the hot summer months. Okay, so let's look at other societal impacts. It wasn't just the nasty reek odor, right? It was other things. These cities, because they were crammed with people, right, we notice all sorts of problems. Organized crime, people struggling to, uh, to make ends meet, they resort to prostitution, um, robbery, theft. Uh, drug abuse and drinking were, were huge problems. Opium became a major problem during the Industrial Revolution. We'll get to that again uh, in the next unit. Uh, but those all became horrible realities of these urban centers and eventually pollution. So down here I've included a cartoon of somebody called Father Thames, which was a kind of an allegory or a personification of the filthy, stinky River Thames flowing through the city of London. So here's this poor kid looking to take a bath, but he ain't going to swim down here with all these dead animals and pollution and whatnot. <clears throat> all right. There were, as I mentioned, though, some improvements. Standards of living were getting better, and so people could convert their wages into buying the things that they actually wanted. And so we notice people are starting to not only buy better food, but maybe they have multiple sets of clothing. If people are lucky enough, they could buy a house or at least rent in a nicer neighborhood. And for other people, there was actually maybe a little bit of leisure time in your life. So people start to read a little bit. And if you had a little bit of money, you might want to try to increase that by going to horse races or dog races, watching some boxing matches with patches of hula hand down here. Um, Cockfighting, not an adult website. Uh, that's when you have two you know, chickens uh, fight each other to death. It's, it's a blast, right? You can make a lot of money watching animals kill each other. That's actually really weird. Oh, and then the best part of all is sports. So look, at here's Liverpool's very first team. But all the way even in the middle of the 19th century, Sheffield, a team known as the Blades, because they come from the steel-producing Midlands of England, there's a little factory town, right? It gives this cultural working class identity. So the factory owners of one region, they become a club. And the factory workers of another region, they become a club. And so there's tribal pride. Now, let's bring this thing on home. Reforms. People did try to fix these problems. Not everyone was cool with watching children getting maimed or women have their heads ripped off or, you know, kids working 16 hours in some sort of mine. And so petitioning government was an early approach to try to fix these things. But the government didn't want to fix these things because business was good, money was good, and the middle class also didn't want these things to be fixed. And so the middle class wanted votes, but they didn't want reforms. And they didn't want votes for everyone, they wanted votes for themselves. And so everything moved slowly and corruptly. And so socialists, utopian socialists, people like Robert Owen see this firsthand, right? He owned a factory that was doing well, but he was sickened by the suffering of people. And so he built these societies where there would be schools and shops and doctors and jobs. And so everyone would work in this like perfectly uh, provided for little bubble. Just didn't work, right? There wasn't enough profit margin. And as the rest of the world was greedy, Robert Owen fell behind. And that proved to people like my boy, angry Santa Claus here, Karl Marx, that it would never truly be solved until there was a global revolution between the bourgeoisie, the filthy rich middle class, and the proletariat, the worldwide workers. Okay, And so he called not for England or Germany to solve the problem. He wanted workers of every nation to band together. A German factory worker and a British factory worker had more in common with each other than they did with the middle class or the ruling elite of their own nations. And so Marxism sold this message of revolution, and it was very popular because for people who don't own anything, making private property illegal doesn't hurt them. Women also like this because Marx was a true 
feminist and the fact that he wanted full equality for men and women. Okay, where does this all lead? England remains dominant. The industrial rev does not slow down. And although there are some improvements like mandatory public education, and eventually they have uh, rules on factories about like the age of children that can work in the, in the mills and the factories and the hours they can work, but business remains king. And as all these goods are being made, that sucks up resources. England doesn't grow cotton. Right, so they need to put the tentacles of empire around the world, suck the resources out of other places, bring them back home, shove them in machines, make shirts out of them, and then sell them back to the people in their colonies. God, it's almost so evilly efficient. And so because of their technology and their banking and their better guns and their huge ships, industry makes Europe dominant. It's not because white was right but it's because technology had made Europe more advanced, all right? And so the last step wasn't just colonies, but it was things like building canals, right, in Egypt that would allow England to have a faster route to India and all of the tea, porcelain, and cotton that could be found there. And so look at all the ships queued up, the lifeline to India. And so finally, the rest of the world notices this, and they want to slice. They want to get in on the action. Africa. South America, they never really get to. They're too technologically behind and too dominated by Europe to ever get out of that shadow. Japan, on the other hand, they will copy European tactics and become an absolute power, going, in essence, in the span of 80 years from being a feudal society with samurai to being a nation with warships taking over most of Asia and almost winning a world war. And so we have a little propaganda here as Russia and Japan will fight to show off who's the more technologically advanced. And I'll give you a spoiler. It wasn't Russia. Right, but we're going to dabble with these in our final couple chapters as we bring it on home to the end of the year. All right, guys, if you have questions, feel free to email or hit me in the comments. I hope this helped. And again, stay safe. Thanks. Bye.